This program is brought to you by the City of Fountains Coaches Association. Carlos Nelson with Cascade Sports. And today uh, we have the head coach of Florida AMM, uh, also known as FAMU. Who do we have here? Robert McCollum, head men's basketball coach at FAMU. Hey, hey coach, uh, I always start off uh, asking my coaches to talk about the first time they fell in love with their sport and uh, to talk about uh, the people that help you reach the goals and your skill set right now. As I always explain, uh, you know how when you get a, a star player and the media comes or the people, they associate that star player with the coach. But yeah. there was a whole lot of different people who helped that star player get to where he's at. And they don't get the accolades. And there were people in your life, coaches, mentors, and it's time to reflect and give them uh, their propers on who helped you rise to the occasion to become head coach. And then we'll start talking about FAMU, HBCUs, and your program. Good enough. Well, that, uh, the, when, the, when I fell in love with the game, that's easy. Um, and I, I put it this way. Uh, basketball was my calling. I was literally called to coach. Just as we hear and have known, I've heard ministers say my entire life, they were called to preach. I was called to coach. I was coaching before I knew I was coaching, before I knew Mr. what coach. Is there something else on? I'm getting a reverberation in your. It's, it's some type of reverberation when you're, when you're, when you're talking. Is there, is there any of the electronics on in there? No. All right, that's that was all right. Go, go ahead. You was called a coach. Yeah, so when I was 12, 13 years of age, I would organize kids in the little alley where I grew up in baseball okay. in Birmingham, Alabama. My and, vice president's from there. Okay. And we would, uh, you know, hit ground balls to them, fly balls, all of that stuff. And then we would go over and play games against the kids that lived in the home houses on the paved streets. <laughs> I like that. And interestingly, we always won. And then eventually um, the, the project that I grew up in, uh, even the people over those, that particular project, they sensed uh, leadership qualities uh, in me and, uh, so during the summer months or whatever, they would ask me to coach teams. So coaching is the most natural thing uh, I've ever done. And the uh, next to my mother, the most influential person uh, in my life in terms of me uh, growing into manhood and becoming a basketball coach is my high school coach uh, by the name of Willis Scoggins, Willis Scoggins Jr. Um, who uh, passed in back in 20, 2008. Interestingly, he and my mom passed six weeks apart. So the Where last time- did you go to, Coach? I went to Hayes, Hayes High School. What position did you play? A uh, forward. How tall are you, Coach? Uh, with shoes, 6'4". All right. Was you, uh, uh, was you rough and ready or was you silky smooth? I could rebound the ball. That was kind of my forte. I could do a little bit. wasn't a, a really good shooter, but I was. Uh, I could do a little bit of everything. I could handle the basketball. I was a good passer. I uh, had a very good basketball IQ. I uh, was a good teammate. And um, so uh, my, my high school coach, Willis Goggins, um, had the greatest impact on me. He was a stickler for fundamentals, a great teacher, great teacher, strong disciplinarian. You did things by the book. 
you played hard, you were fundamentally sound, you looked good, uh, your uniforms were clean, your, your sneakers, your white Chuck Taylor All-Stars were clean, the floor was shiny. Uh, so he, he had a, a, a system in place where his teams were distinguishable by how fundamentally sound they were. And when you left there, you were, you were, your transition into college basketball, wherever you went, was going to be a lot easier. Uh, I got to know George Ravelin through my high school coach. Because George Ravelin <clears throat> was an assistant coach at Villanova in the mid-60s. And he would come down to the Deep South to recruit. So he, he met my high school coach somewhere around 64, 65. And they were best of friends until his death. And uh, so when blacks <clears throat> could not attend the SEC schools for sports, of course, schools from north, northeast, out west would come down south. And so I met George Ravelin through my high school coach. I'm going to interrupt you for a minute. Uh, you know, the athletic director at UMKC, he was from California, and George Ravelin was his mentor. Okay, okay. And George has mentored so, so many people. And so I'm uh, very blessed to be able to call, to call him a friend uh, and mentor. Uh, oh gosh, for, for more than 35 years. So in terms of uh, professionally, uh, he really helped groom me and guide me from uh, this, how to conduct an interview. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you name it. And uh, then uh, London Hamilton uh, and I have been friends for 39 years. It's interesting that we've been friends for 39 years. Uh, he and I met in 1981. And when we met, it's as if we'd known each other five years. And here we are now. We, we work a half mile apart from each other. I'm not familiar with him. Little no. Hamilton, Little Hamilton, the head basketball coach at Florida State. All right. And clearly, uh, just uh, done a tremendous job uh, at Florida State. He's been there since '02, and Little made a name for himself way back in the early '70s at, at Austin P. Uh, with a player named uh, James Fly Williams. Then he went on to Kentucky and had great success there through his first head job at Oklahoma State, then to University of Miami. And he was head coach of the Wizards in 2004 year. And he's been at Florida State since 02. From uh, once I got into college, um, from, a, from a, a basketball standpoint, X's and O's, if you, if you will, uh, Lon Kruger, the current coach at the University of Oklahoma, uh, has had uh, the greatest impact from a basketball standpoint, X and O. Uh, he and I worked together for 11 years, 1989-90 uh, at Kansas State, and for the next 11 years from Kansas State, University of Florida, for six years. There we uh, led our team to the Final Four during the 93-94 season, and then on to University of Illinois for four years. And then uh, after four years at Illinois, I was named head coach at Western Michigan University in 2000. And then interestingly, two months later, he was named the head basketball coach of the Atlanta Hawks. So, and of course, I've learned basketball from so many different people, picking up things here and there. But those are the people who have had the greatest uh, impact uh, on my rise, on my basketball career. Hey, coach, do your players really understand that? Uh, do you ever – do you talk to them about that? Do they know your history? Oh, some, somewhat. Um, as you may know, kids nowadays uh, uh, are not you wouldn't you wouldn't call them history buffs by I any. First, I was going to ask you this. Excuse me for cutting you off. 
earlier in your conversation, the first thing that you said that you had a basketball IQ and uh, do you find that these kids have that? That's why, you know, you mentioned names. I'm, I'm 68. You mentioned names that I, I know. And uh, I, I would think the, all of those were thoroughbreds. Those are, those are people that uh, really have taken basketball, the, the whole sport, to another level. Yes, yes. So I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how much they know. I, I'm one, I'm, I'm careful to not toot my own horn uh, so much. Um, but um, it's there for them to see and learn the, the, the highs and lows. Because I think the highs and lows, the obstacles, all of those things that we, we deal with in life uh, help make us the people that we are. Uh, let's, let's, let's get a little bit, let's talk about, uh, your tenure there at FAMU and, uh, how long have you been there? I just completed my third year. Uh, what did you inherit? Um, I inherited, um, I inherited a program that, um, The, 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 my predecessor um, was was uh, at FAMU for three years, and quite frankly, uh, never received uh, the kind of support uh, that he needed. He inherited a bad situation. His predecessor inherited a bad situation. So, quite frankly, there had been a lack of stability, not only uh, from the basketball coaches seat, but in football, the athletic director, the president. So you go back, so there's about a 10, 12 year stretch where seemingly every three or four years, someone in one of those chairs was changing. And so you can't, you can't build nor sustain anything worthwhile without stability. And so what I did when I came in I try to first and foremost to uh, begin building a foundation with an emphasis on academics because there were some academic issues. There were some APR issues. There were GPA issues. There were three players among the, I don't know, eight, ten that I inherited that were going to be academically ineligible. So I wasn't going to begin my tenure that way. Hey, Coach, I know what that's like. I went to my, my freshman year, I went to Virginia State on a track scholarship back in uh, uh, 69, 70. My first year, I had a 0.7 grade point average. People say, no, Mr. Nelson, you had a 1.7. I was right. like, no. I, and, and, and I wasn't even eligible to do the sport that I was there for. I wound up getting myself together going to Manhattan College that summer, uh, taking summer courses and transferring to, to Central State. But uh, the era that I came from at that time, uh, the mindset was if you was a good athlete, everything was taken care of. And I don't know whether that's the mindset of these kids now, but uh, we're primarily a high school website. and trying to talk to the high school kids as it relates to uh, their academics. Because if you've been to our site, the first thing it says, Cascade Sports, home of the student athlete. Yes. Uh, you know, your, your talent only takes you so far, but a coach is not going to lose his job giving you a scholarship and you fail off. Talk about that, that academic part again. Absolutely. Well, one of my – well, the first mentor I ever had was a guy by the name of Johnny Carey. Johnny was five years older than me, graduated from the same high school, kind of grew up in, the, in my community because he was five years older. And so I knew of him, and he was uh, – kids looked up to him. He played at South Carolina State. So after graduating from college, straight out of college, he came back. He was assistant coach at my high school. And one of the things he said to me early on, 
was to use college as a stepping stone. You use basketball as a stepping stone to get a college education. And at that time, there was no one in my family, immediate or any, any that I knew that had graduated from college. That was a motivation to, to make my mom proud, do something that hadn't been done. All those things were, mot were motivators. But Johnny Carey's uh, comments stuck with me, as well as the motivation to, of doing something that people don't think you're going to do or you're capable of doing. Uh, and so that, that, was, uh, that was my approach. And uh, so I attended a junior college, Seminole Junior College in Sanford, Florida. And uh, so f for me, basketball, academics have always been very, very important. I'm not, a, I'm not a very sensitive person, but the one, there's one thing that really would irk me, and that is the dumb job reference. That's how, that's how, listen, I found my, you know how football players come to school early when uh, the uh, season starts, you know, the, 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 the college class comes about two or three weeks later, but the football yeah. players have been on campus. And I used to make fun of the football players all the time, the dumb jock, because yeah. they were, they were uh, in remedial reading and right. remedial stuff. I found myself there that second semester. But uh, to tell you a little bit about Cascade Sports, we have uh, another segment of, when you go to the website called Bridging the Gap Between Sports and Education. And uh, you use the same words that one of my mentors, Mr. Leon Dixon, uh, who was headed up the Du Bois Learning Center, I never really looked at education like this, and this is about 14 years ago. And he said, Carlos, how many people you know uh, got scholarships and went on to play NBA or play professional sports? But how many people do you know that played a sport, got an education, and now that education is taking care of them for the rest of their life? And that's what you just described. And I don't think that we, like you said, you didn't have uh, too many people uh, talking to you in that uh, that that frame, and uh, do you feel that uh, these kids now are, are seeing it? One of the primary reasons I'm doing HBCUs, we don't have a whole lot of money, but we have a large uh, internet following, and when you talk about you must be somewhere in my age group because back then that's where you went to hbcus and a lot of times you were the first to get an education in your family yes or college or college degree well you 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 you're absolutely right i'll tell you a quick story relative to this about the hbcu piece when I interviewed at FAMU, one of the questions to me was, how do you think you'll be able to function or get along at an HBCU? You think you'd be able to work at an HBCU? And granted, I'd never worked at HBCU. Uh, so my, my response was, are you, are you really asking me that? That, that was my, my initial response. I said, well, I'll start out this way. Until my senior year in college, my senior year in high school, we played in the, in the state basketball tournament, which at that time was played on the campus of the University of Alabama. I'd never gone on a white, on a white campus. Still, probably for the next three, four, five, six years, I still had not. The only, the first college campus I ever set foot on was Tuskegee. We went, we drove down to play from Birmingham to play Tuskegee High School. And our coach, we got there early so he could take the team over to watch Tuskegee College practice. And a coach was well known by the name of Oscar Catlin. Oscar Catlin would, once he got out of college coaching, he actually came back and was a coach at, at Hayes High School, my high school, four or five years after I graduated, then only to move on to be assistant coach at UAB, 
under the legendary Gene Bartow. So Tuskegee College was the only campus I'd ever set foot on. So I knew about college basketball through the SIEC is all I knew because Miles College practiced in my high school gym every day and played their games. So that's what I grew up on. I grew up, I cut my teeth on those teams in the, in the SIAC. And, and so that uh, I've always had a great deal of respect and admiration and that gave me an appreciation. So I wasn't one of these people where, because I never worked at an HBCU, uh, it prevented me from being able to relate. It prevented me from being able to care. Or I never had to deal with the, with the, the, the notion that an HBCU was less than. And so I just last, third, last Wednesday, I was on a similar uh, Zoom uh, set up with, uh, out, of, out of Georgia. And it was done for high school coaches and junior college coaches. And one of the things I talked about was that far too long, we at HBCUs, we allow the public, we allow the media to put us in a box. An HBCU is just who, that's just our history. That's our beginning when we weren't, or by law, could not be included. So since we couldn't be included, we, get, we established our own. And so, but, so the example I gave is, let me give you an example. I said, if one were to read, go and check the U.S. News and World Report, yes, there'll be a category where they'll rank HBCUs. I said, but those same HBCUs, they're also going to be ranked in other categories. For example, I said, Florida a and University is one of the top public universities in the country. So you're going to see Florida a and rank above Florida Atlantic University, University of North Florida. We are ranked just along with Southern Illinois University. I said, we also, you go to another category of national universities. I said, national university is, those schools are distinguished by the amount of research that's done at those universities, and they have to offer degrees, undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral degrees. I said, so we are public university, yes, with HBCU, but we're also a national university. I said, so far, I don't know whether you can hear me, Coach, but your your internet had went out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm good. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I'm saying uh, far too often uh, that information is not out there, and so when people do some research, they'll be stunned to find the quality academic program that the folk for how how a university speaks for these needs, needs no introduction. Right. Thank FAMU's, FAMU's School of Pharmacy needs no introduction. And I tell people, we go into to kids' homes, I say, if you go into a Walgreen or CVS and you see a black pharmacist, the chances are better than not that that pharmacist graduated from FAMU because we produce more black pharmacists than any school in the country. Right. Well, this is what I would like to say also. Uh, and that's another reason why we're featuring HBCUs. See, uh, our HBCUs do not get the funding, the scholarships that uh, these other universities get for the most part, but they have to compete on that same playing field. Uh, second of all, uh, the big universities with that money, they've been able to create this facade per se that our youngsters that come out of our community because we we put out so, so many professional athletes uh from hbcus back in our day right and uh now kids are looking at those large universities and i'm I, and the ones that i have any influence i'm like so you go to a division one and you sit on the bench for four years 
that you call that uh, doing something uh, when you can go to a HBCU and as you said when they asked you that question you fit in you don't have to do I fit in because those kids come from the same background that you come from yes HBCUs are nurturing I would have I had scholarships to Brown, to Syracuse, and my coach had went to Syracuse with Jim Brown and them, but he ran track. He said, Carlos, you wouldn't last two seconds on them campuses, and you know what they were like back in the 70s. Uh, and HBCU got me through. It was like everybody knows you, all the teachers, whether you play sports or not, you're gonna know, know most of them students on the campus by face or what have you. And you get out of line, one of them teachers or administration gonna know about it. Yes, yes. And so you're, you're exactly right. And it's uh, here at FAMU, uh, our motto is excellence with caring. And so you, you mentioned the, the, the Division I schools. We are a Division I school. So you have uh, HBCUs, the SWAT and the MEAC. All of those HBCUs are Division One. The other uh, HBCUs are Division Two and NAI. Uh, but yet, you got three different levels of Division One. You have what's called a low major, a mid major, and the high majors. And the higher you go, they have greater resources. They have the very plush uh, facilities or what have you. So yet, uh, so I, I feel I bring up somewhat of a unique experience to FAMU from the, from the standpoint that uh, I've had been blessed to have had some vast experiences. I've coached in every major conference in the country. What do you find the difference in them conferences per se in the conference that you're in now? Resources. Didn't take me long to respond to that. Simply put, resources. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the big difference. The amount of money they have to go out and recruit, the ability to, to wine and dine, to travel to games on a charter flight. Recruiting. Uh, recruiting, the, the, the practice facilities and, and the amount, degree of uh, televised games. And, 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 just, and just all of those things, that quite frankly, uh, they're going to be very difficult you know, for a 17 to 19, 20 year old kid to turn down. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, that's how society measures success by, you know, so many material things. And so it, it becomes difficult. And then you also, you have, if, a, if a parents, now if parents attended HBCU, we have a shot to some degree. Because you, then you, otherwise you have that mindset, well, uh, I, I want my, hey. I want my, I want my kids, uh, to be, to be better than I was. Well, you can be, your, your kids can be, can have it better than you had it. Go ahead, keep but, talking. Okay. They don't have to attend a predominantly white school to necessarily have it better than you had it. So I think that, you know, sometimes the reasons why people choose other schools uh, vary, but yet I don't buy the argument that in order to be, well, I don't my kids to come up rough or hard or tough like I did. So that doesn't mean that attending a bigger school, a non HBCU school is going to be best. It's, it's all about, it's all about fit and trying to find a place where a particular young man or young lady can have some success academically, and if they're an athlete in their chosen sport, if they can socially, if they can, and, and, and if they can find what they want at, in those areas that will put them on a path towards success. Yeah, the, be the best path. Hey, Coach, see, I think we might have done a dozen interviews thus far uh maybe a little more with hbcu coaches you all have that same story uh the path to success uh 
what uh the the financial thing i know it uh when when i did lincoln's football coach that's here and you know a little bit because you said you was at kansas about the kansas city area well no i coached at kansas state for one for one year right, but but i'm I, just saying you know about this part of the country that's what i'm i'm saying uh, yes. uh, uh i'm from new york originally okay and, and uh i've been here since 78 but Lincoln College, uh, in, in, in their conference, they're against the Bearcats up in Maryville, perennial uh, champions. And uh, they, they have multi-million dollar uh, boosters and everything else. They get 30 scholarships. Lincoln gets 16. And Coach was saying, uh, that really shows up on the field, especially in the Absolutely. second, second Absolutely. half. All right, and, and and so there's only been one, maybe two HBCUs that I've talked to that felt they had everything. I think that was Spring Hill and 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 another school that felt they had all the money they needed and everything. But it seems like uh, that's a recurring theme. And at Central State, uh, one of our last presidents. Uh, I just had seen he had a two hour uh, interview and he was talking about how Wright State had uh, was the same uh, level uh, under Central State and the state kept putting them having a doctoral program, a master's program. And you get more. You, you ran that down what, what, what you all do. And. That puts more money in the budget. That puts your, your your university more attractive. But a lot of times, that's not happening for a lot of the HBCUs. And that, that's that's correct. And it, this is a conversation for a different day. But you you bring up an interesting point, and that has been uh, an uh, issue for years and years throughout the country, but especially in the South. For example, in the state of Alabama, uh, what you're alluding to is for years and years, uh, the funding wasn't equal. So uh, Alabama State and Alabama A&M, two state public institutions, filed a lawsuit against the, University, against the state of Alabama, contending that for X number of years, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, uh, the funding at University of Alabama, University of Auburn University, uh, Alabama, Birmingham, those schools, uh, all of those state schools uh, was far superior to what Alabama State, Alabama a &M got. Even if you base it on per student. And so after a number of years, the state awarded, I don't know how many millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to right the wrong, those wrongs. Uh, the University of Mississippi filed a similar lawsuit because Jackson State, Alcorn, and Mississippi Valley State Universities uh, had received far less funding than Ole Miss, Mississippi State. And each time the state, uh, the courts uh, agreed and, and uh, ruled on behalf of the HBCUs, and each time the state of Mississippi would appeal, they would appeal. Now, recently, I think the state of Maryland has filed a similar lawsuit. So, in essence, that's what you're saying. You're talking about right state and central state. Uh, and so that... And I wasn't aware. And I don't think, excuse me for cutting you off, I don't think our community as a whole are aware of what's been going on for the last 30 years. And now, because... Uh, he he went even as far as says Central State only had one road to get to Central State, but they put the super highways by Wright State. They put all the amenities, and that's almost like our communities. I'm gonna get off that. Let's go to uh, your your recruiting, and you've been there three years. Uh, you left off saying that uh, there were some eligibility problems. Uh, let's Let's go from there. What you've been able to do to now build that program and shape that program the way you want to uh, see it run. 
Yes. So we we came in and, and put some structure in place in terms of uh, expectations academically. So one, we breakfast is mandatory. So if you get and go to breakfast, chances are you're gonna go you're gonna go to class. So if you live on campus or if you live off campus, Monday through Friday, breakfast is mandatory. The kids, the upperclassmen that lived off campus, they lived where they wanted to live. So we said going forward, after this particular lease, I was hired in May of 17. So the upperclassmen already signed another year's lease. So going forward, if you're gonna be off campus, all of you are gonna be in the exact same apartment complex. Because I'm ultimately, I'm responsible for you. I'm responsible for your provision and your protection. And so if something happens, if you're not in a safe situation, whatever the case may be, the buck stops right here. So we uh, class checks. We have weekly meetings with academic advisors. Uh, if we are gone for a trip between three to five days, which means, for example, in, in conference play, we'll leave on Friday, return on Tuesday. We'll play, uh, we play Saturday, Monday, for the most part, throughout the MEAC season. So on those trips, we have an academic advisor with us. And so just structure, and we like to think we recruited a better caliber of student. And we let it be known early on, these are the expectations academically. And so little by little, the players are bought in. Our APR, we had APR issues when we arrived on, on, on board. So uh, we, uh, we have a year our uh, second year, we could not go to postseason play. We couldn't play in the NEAC tournament because of APR issues. So we have overcome the single year. You, you're expected to stay above a 930. So we came, we were hired. It was, uh, uh, APR was 843. So each subsequent year, we went from an 843 to a 956 to a 963 to this year, 1,000. So I've had 11 seniors that have finished their eligibility. All 11 have graduated, including five seniors on this year's team, all graduated in the spring. And though we don't have as many tutors as we like, as we need, but yet uh, we travel, uh, the department provides every kid with a laptop. I'm sorry, with, the, with an iPad, if they don't have their own laptop. Every kid has an iPad to travel with. We have an academic advisor. We they use Blackboard, as most institutions do. Uh, whenever if a player needs to be late for practice because of something academic related or has to leave early, no problem. But for the most part, we've just put structure in place and talked about the 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 uh, how important it is uh, for them to get their degree. And I think they see that we we class check even our coaches. We roll up our sleeves and go to work instead of saying we don't have the staff, we can't have as many, we don't have as many uh, GAs or whatever the case may be to check classes. The department can't afford for everyone to check all of the sports. So we check classes. So you day. have, uh, what you've explained to me right now, uh, you started, I used to be in construction and uh, you're building a, a solid foundation. I was like, that breakfast thing, that's, that was re real clever there. Everybody's, cause that was my problem. You, you sleep and you don't, you don't go to class. Uh, yes, yes. And so we go, we, we hold them, we, we hold them accountable. Yeah. So, 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 so early, early, early on in the season, if someone missed classes, you know, we get them up, we get the whole team up, you know, we run them early. And uh, for the most part, that kind of nips it in the bud. That sort of solved that, you know, right away. And then we try and we, we feel like we, we year, each year we bring in uh, young men, not all of them are A or B students, but they, uh, they understand what they are coming into. We, they feel, like, we feel like we've created uh, an environment, an atmosphere that's conducive to them getting their degrees. And so you have to have that atmosphere. In other words, those young men around you, that has to be their goal. Uh, and, and they're a good fit socially. Uh, and so 
uh, when they, if two or three of them are out at night someplace, chances are you're going to see seven, eight of the entire team. So they live in the same dorms on campus. With their freshmen, they move off campus. They're all in the same apartment complexes. So all of those things can help. All those things help build chemistry, help build camaraderie. And in addition to that, we use other resources. We're bringing in black doctors to talk to uh, 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 our players. We're bringing in people to do banking. All of those other things that financial those, literacy. Yes, we bring all all of those things. You know, another thing, Carlos. We have we play most HBCUs. We play a lot of what you call guarantee games. So if a team goes in and plays, we went to Kansas State last year because it was a big payday. So we have to do a lot of that. That's how you help support the, the overall athletic budget. Well, I tried also try to schedule in such a way that our players can benefit socially, that their horizons can be broadened uh, through the travel. For example, doing um, November of 2018, we took the team to Montego Bay for five days. Mm. They will treasure that trip the rest of their lives. They lived in a five-star hotel right on the ocean. Both games were televised on CBS Sports. Uh, they had food around. I mean, it's it just everything that you can want on a five-day trip. They went a place none of them had gone before. And uh, might we, never uh, be able to do again. If you've only right. had bologna all your life, you think a bologna and cheese sandwich is great until you get some steak and lobster, yeah. and that's what you gave them. And li literally and figuratively. <laughs> yes, literally and figuratively. But yet, we, during that entire trip, we also took advantage of the opportunity to take them into some of the neighborhoods in Jamaica to say, look, you got the, where you're staying, that's tourists. That's tourism. That's the main, uh, that's, the, that's the main money maker. That's the resource for the country. But let's get down to real life, everyday life. So we took them in some, in, in the, in some to neighborhoods where the bus could barely get up and down those hills, barely go onto those streets because the streets were so narrow. And they saw, we took them down to the markets. They saw people, how people live in. We, we did that to try to give them a better appreciation, let them know, you know what? I've got it pretty good. I've, got, I've right. really been blessed. This past season, we went to um, we went to Hawaii for five days, and uh, there we went out to Pearl Harbor, like most teams would take. So you don't have to be at the University of to take the team to Pearl Harbor. You know, we took our team to Pearl Harbor. We also took our team to an authentic Polynesian luau. They love and that. It, and so again, but these are all things that will broaden their horizon. Just as important. Uh, two years ago, we took our team to the Smithsonian, the African American Museum of History in D.C. And they, they were flat blown away just to see the appreciation they had for that. You know, or if we're in Atlanta, you know, uh, we go over to Dr. Kitta Ebenezer to the bird site. It'd be great. I mean, all of those things. You know, again, uh, we're in Portland. We go call up Nike. We do a a tour of Nike and to hear the, the two people conducting the tour point over to the building that was under construction, which would be the tallest building on Nike's campus. It's going to be called the Serena Williams building. Excellent. Excellent. So, so again, you know, we basketball affords all of those opportunities. So when we schedule, we schedule with those things in mind, taking an NBA game, but we're in a city where it has an NBA uh, uh, team. So again, all those things. I feel as a as a as a black man, I have a sense of responsibility that's perhaps greater or different than someone that doesn't look like me. Because at the end of the day, when they leave, I I don't want them to say, "Well, Coach McCollum never talked to us about that." No, Coach McCollum never talked to us about how to be a man. He never talked to us about the language we should and shouldn't use around women. Uh, so, again, I have a responsibility. Others may take that for granted. It may not be that big of a deal. But to me, it is. Because, again, 
it's more than just about basketball. I feel a sense of responsibility. We're teaching life's lessons. We're trying to prepare our young men to be successful uh, once they once they leave us. And you know, we volunteerism, community service. You know, so the best leaders are servants. Hey, hey, coach. That's why at the beginning of this interview, I I, I said, who helped you build your skill set? your life skill set. Now, we, we haven't even really talked about ball per se, and uh, that's somewhat been on purpose because I want my audience and I want my interviews to be different where you get to know who this coach is, what this coach's belief is, and uh, how this coach came from A to Z. And I think that, uh, the mentors that you've had help you understand issues like you're doing with your with 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 the kids that you're in charge of. So tell me a little bit about uh, your record from the time that uh, you inherit the program, what they were doing, uh, and where you're at now. So. Uh... My first year, we went seven and nine in the MEAC. We were picked 11th. Each year, we finished higher than we picked. We, we were picked 11th. We picked 11th, I think ninth, and and eighth or ninth. Uh, and so, my first year, I think we finished tied for seventh. Uh, my second year, we finished nine and seven in the conference, which is the first. Winning record in the MEAC in 12 years. We followed the nine and seven year up with a season that just ended with a 10 and six. Record in the MEAC tied for fourth. First back to back winning seasons in the MEAC since the 06 07 season. Do you think the administration understands? Because I deal with high school a lot and uh, I try to uh, say this to uh, the administration here: You cannot win a win. You cannot have a winning program with a revolving door with your coaches and administration, because I think administration has a gigantic part in you having a winning season. And what I uh, what I say. Uh, the same thing that you pointed out about your pharmacy program and the different programs that you have. You mentioned UCLA or USC. You think basketball or Stanford, and you think football. You think uh, football with USC. But that does not negate that they don't have great academic programs. And a lot of times the administration, they're so on the academic part not even understanding the relevance, you have winning sports program, that's gonna increase your enrollment. I don't care whether it's high school, college, or whatever, because people wanna be associated with winners. But getting Very that mindset- point. Very good point. Is, is hard. And what, what, what I can see uh, just by what you're saying, what your record is, that slowly but surely, because first of all, you only can work with the athletes that you have. And, it seemed like you have built this culture where now you have some you have some uh, juniors and possibly seniors that have bought into how you coach your philosophy, and that's a trickle down effect to uh, to the kids. And the more you have them buying in, and you getting uh, you don't have to have the top talent, but if you're getting any kind of talent. Your, your record is going to increase and your program is going to get stronger, in my eyesight. Absolutely. And, and uh, you, you made a lot of good points there. One, you made about, um, uh, you mentioned U USC, UCLA's academics, but then you also mentioned about, uh, you know, programs when you win, how it, it increases enrollment and everything. The current coach at USC, was an assistant coach on the Lone Hamilton at Florida State. He was named head coach at Florida Gulf Coast University in Panama City. And so he 
they, they made it to the NCAA tournament, and he advanced, he advanced all the way to the Sweet 16. And they, the program, they had a very athletic team. They gave him the nickname Dunk City. So that kind of stuck. He goes from two good seasons at Florida Gulf Coast. They see enrollment. This, the university is located right on the Gulf of Mexico. Very scenic, very beautiful. They do not have football. So basketball is the only money maker, only possible money maker. So they go to the NCAA tournament. Now you you get in television television exposure, so that you otherwise would not get. So in addition to when you plan the game, so that that time span in between those weeks when you advance into the tournament from one weekend to the next, that's a week's worth of exposure that would be pretty costly, very valuable. Well, that coach goes from the enrollment, they saw a huge jump in enrollment to the degree that he parlayed that to a job at USC. Then his his his, uh, predecessor, his uh, successor, he came in, he had additional success, and so they saw enrollment clients. I mean, it happens, it happens all the time, even because University of Alabama has long had great football tradition, that's no secret, but they've almost doubled. How about that? They've almost doubled their enrollment. Right. In, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the 12, 13 years that Nick Saban has been there. How about that? They've gone from 18, 19,000 students to 36, 37,000 students. And the success of football is a direct correlation. So you're absolutely right. Let me, you know, uh, the, 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 to finish what I was saying about our success, so not only did we go 10 and six back-to-back winning seasons, we also went undefeated at home this year. First time that's in big. 30, that, That's larger than life. First time in 31 years that we've had an undefeated season, home season in basketball. Because now they want to come. People that didn't come to games will be at the games uh, this, this, this upcoming season. Uh, quad, this, this virus has really turned the world upside down. It has. But what I want to say about that also, my tenure as uh, in the seventies, no band could beat Florida A and M. Florida A <laughs> and M set set. I'm saying set the standards for. I don't care you division one or you out of space division. <laughs> Florida A and M had the steppers and everybody copied. The March of one hundred. Yeah, I didn't know what the name was, but yes. all I can say is they set the standards. And I know just no sports or nothing else, people that had to increase their enrollment. Well, yeah, of course. And, of course, like I said, they've got, they've got a very good uh, business program, a school of uh, business and industry. And, of course, uh, when you uh, – the, the CEO of Microsoft, John Thompson, Came out of came out of that program. Well, the so, head of the Black Chamber here is a Florida A and M graduate. Back yeah, so yeah, and the School of Journalism. You got you know Pam Pam Oliver came out of the School of Journalism, uh, who's who's worked NFL Fox for for years and years. So just across the board, what we what we call that, what we talk about, we like to say we want our program to get to a point. We we definitely headed in that direction along with our academics. The best of both worlds, the best of both worlds, and it's attainable. And uh, we we think big. That's that's our team, Monica. Think big. Hey, coach. Uh, in wrapping up, uh, is there any parting words that you would have for uh, prospective uh, uh, ballers and for the overall public? Well, you know, I just mentioned think big because far too often we still have too many young people who think they can't. If you think you can't, then you, you, you can't. And so to, to believe in yourself when, when, when no one else will, you, you have to believe in yourself. You have to be willing to pay some dues, to make some sacrifices. And you have to be willing to not give up on yourself for others to not give up on you. Uh, so think big, 
also, um, you can only go as high as your dreams are. Uh, more, more personally, don't feel that you have to go to uh, a predominantly white university. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right. But all I'll say with, to, to our young uh, high school students. And to their parents. Talk to, and to parents. their parents. And to their parents. Uh, just broaden your search. Broaden your search. Because the most important thing is fit. Not the name. The people make the place. Not the name. Those people, we tell, we tell young men, no matter where you go to school, you're going to go through some difficult times. Whether you go to school 500 miles from home or 50 miles. But what's going to make those times easier to deal with is when you know you're surrounded by people that really care for you as a person. That there are doors you can knock on and they're going to welcome you in willingly. They're going to embrace you. They're going to be willing to listen to your concerns, your needs. That's that personal touch. You can't put a price on that. So think big. Uh, give HBCUs uh, a, a sincere look and uh, just cast a, cast a broad net. Uh, you mentioned earlier about Lincoln University. I had a high school teammate who was a couple of years behind me by the name of Harold Robinson. Harold Bear Robinson had great success, played at Lincoln from 74 to 78, and Lincoln had a legendary uh, uh, coach by the name of Don Corbin. He left Lincoln and went on to North Carolina a and and did great things there. The court is named after him. But I knew about Lincoln University from having a high school teammate and then a former young man that I actually coached a little bit in high school to all play at, at, at Lincoln University. But so uh, you can find success. You can find a uh, home. You can find uh, people that welcome you, that care for you. Uh, at HBCUs. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I've had the, the privilege of coaching at every major conference in the country. I coached in the ACC, the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12. I came here from, the, from Oregon, the Pac-12. I've coached a number of mid-major conferences. But yet, my same approach, every day I step onto the floor at Florida a and I have the same level of enthusiasm, the same amount of energy that I had when I was head coach at University of South Florida, when I was head coach at Western Michigan or assistant coach at Florida, or Illinois, Kansas State. And again, I owe that to them. And every day I'm going to, my staff and I are going to give them our best to help them become the best that they can be every single day. Hey, Coach, it was a pleasure having you on the show. And hopefully uh, you'll share this and your communications director will share it. I think an uh, excellent interview. And to me, it's a little short autobiography of who you are, what your values are, and what you bring, bring to the table, and what you brought to the table for FAMU. Uh, and as we always say in closing, when you invest in your community, you're really just investing in yourself. The program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association.